All right. <coughs> so commercial real estate, as we know, there are four main valuation methods for this case study we are going to use. Net operating income for the de target development. So cash flow metric is net operating income. The following assumptions, we're going to use perpetuity, forward and growth. The multiple approach, and they actually do give us multiples, uh, gross potential rental income. Gross potential rental income multiples. Um, so we have those multiples, and then we're going to use the discounted cash flow. It's a high rise office tower in downtown San Francisco, 52 stories and a million square feet. Uh, also shown in the calculations for the valuations using the different methods. Gross potential rental income, it's a million square foot building with an average rent per square foot, full service. Uh, Rent per square foot of 100 bucks per square foot. I think it's even higher than that now. Uh, the net operating income this year is 75 million. Our uh, constant growth rates for Gordon growth are 5% going in and 2% from the terminal. Uh, we are expecting an 11% rate of return. So that's going to be our discount rate. Our terminal discount rate is 13%. We've laid out a five year cash flow projection, obviously you need the six year to calculate the terminal value when you're underwriting these types of properties for a project this size, we would be using a 10 year pro forma. But I didn't want to sit there and use 10 years of cash flow analysis, so I shortened it to, to five years. Uh, the target development cost is 1.5 billion uh, with a 5% holding period. So how do we calculate the uh, first year cash flow? How do you calculate the first year cash flow? Is the cash flow metric, or do they give you the first year cash flow? Nope, they don't give you the first year cash flow. So, how do I calculate the first year cash flow? What is the cash flow metric that we're using? What is it? Well, that's the intrinsic valuation method. What's the cash flow metric? metrics that we use to do valuations. Um, was that from year one to year five or to year six? What, what, what were the cash flow metrics that we used in the other case studies? Uh, what we used EBITDA. What else? What were the cash flow metrics that we were using in the other case studies? Free cash flow? Yeah, we used EBITDA. EPS. These earnings per share. The, uh, the answers are on the pages. They're not up in the gross air or on your phone. What is it? Uh, we're going to use that for the multiple approach, but for the, uh, the first two valuations, we're going to use something else. We're going to use net operating income. Okay. So did they give us the net operating in income for next year or do we have to calculate it? You got to calculate next year. Okay, so what's this year's net operating income? 75,000. Uh, right. How do I get next year's? Multiply it by the pro forma growth rate of okay. uh, 1.12. Got it. So we're assuming a 12% growth rate in the first year. Excellent. Why is it so huge? What? Like the increments, it goes down so quickly. What do you mean? 12, 10, 8, 6, 4, 2%. We'll talk about that later. Okay. Uh, okay, so what's uh, 75 million times 1.12? Sure. Part, part of the 
part of the case study is, the, is what you were talking about, is getting into the nuances associated with valuations. There's, there's no part of this. What'd you get? 94? 84? Can somebody confirm that? Got it. And what's our expected return? What's our discount rate? 11 percent. Got it. So what's 84 million divided by uh, 0.11? Um, Seven sixty-three, six thirty-six, three sixty-three. Okay, let's just round up. Okay. So what, what do we get? Uh, seven sixty-three point six. So seven hundred sixty-four million. Yes. Yeah. Sure, you don't want to write all that. Uh, uh, next one. And then uh, the Gordon Grove, what do we use for the, what's next year's cash flow? Net operating income? What is it? 75? What is it? What's next year's cash flow? 75 million? 84. 84 million. I can say 75. This is how some people do it. They'll say 75 million over and over again until you're going, yeah, it's 75 million. But it's really 84 million. So you got to watch what other people say. Okay. All right. And what's the discount rate? I'm just I'm asking the questions to make sure everybody's following. 11%. 11%. And what's our constant growth rate? Assumption? 10%. What's the, what's the constant growth rate assumption? 5%. And what's 11 uh, minus 0.05? Four point four billion. Thank you. All right. Now we're going to do the multiple approach. You're going to have to take these notes down. I'll go through it slowly. <coughs> so you can write the notes. So the multiple approach is pretty complex. It's a little bit different. Because we're using gross potential rental income. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to calculate the GPRI, the gross potential rental income. And the way you do that is you take the million square feet of the property and you multiply it by the average of rent per square foot. And we're using full service rent. Full service uh, rents basically means that the landlord is going to pay the majority of the taxes, insurance, um, maintenance. Uh, there might be some pass-throughs to the tenant, but it's a full service lease uh, that the landlord does most of the uh, stuff for the property. Okay. Uh, so what's uh, a million square feet times a hundred hundred dollars average rent per square foot? Hundred million. Okay, excellent. All right, got it. Okay, and plus the math isn't too complex, right? So we got a hundred million dollars in gross potential rental income. So that's the top line revenue number. Now in real estate, you have to take out the vacancy and the tenant credit loss factors. Okay, so Salesforce Tower is never going to be a hundred hundred percent fully occupied. There's going to be tenants moving in and moving out. So there's always going to be some vacancy within the building. And the assumption is that when you're underwriting buildings like that, the vacancy rate assumption is 10%. So we always use a structural vacancy rate of 10%. 10% all the time? Um, we use that when we're underwriting these properties. If I'm underwriting another property, let's say I'm looking at a Class B building in downtown Oakland that was built in the 1950s, um, not, anybody, not everybody's going to want to lease in that building. So I might actually use a 20% vacancy factor because it's an older building in an inferior location. But usually for these institutional grade properties of this size and this technology, we're going to use, just to be conservative, a 10% vacancy loss. And a tenant, 
a vacancy and a tenant loss factor. Because most some tenants that you that people get into the building uh, may go bankrupt and default on their leases. Okay. Uh, that's probably not going to happen right now, but in 2001, when we had the dot-com bust, a lot of these office buildings in downtown San Francisco were basically occupied by startup companies. And the majority of those stock, uh, startup companies went bankrupt. So there was huge vacancy loss factors in those buildings that had a lot of those firms. So we use a 10% vacancy loss factor, vacancy and credit, tenant credit loss factor, 10% of gross potential rental income. So 10% of 100 million is what? 10 million. So basically our loss factor is 10 million. And we usually, when we're leasing up these buildings, we give rent concessions, we give free rent to induce tenants in the marketplace to move into our building so that we can lease it up very quickly. So we're going to give away free rent. Okay? And we have to include that free rent concession in the calculation. And I figured, okay, you know, at least two million bucks in free rent concessions. So basically 12 million okay, that we have to take from the gross potential rental income. So it's 100 million minus 12 million. Okay. So we basically have gross effective rental income of 88 million. Now this building is state of the art. It's brand new. It's got all kinds of efficiencies, automation, new equipment, state of the art glass, tinting, you know, steel, concrete, everything. So it's really, really efficient. So the uh, cost to operate the building is really low compared to older buildings that may have been built in the 60s, 70s, or 80s. Most office buildings, um, the operating expenses uh, can get as high as 40% of your gross potential rental income. But this building is so new and so efficient that the expenses make up only 30% of the gross potential rental income. So what's 30% of 100 million? Million. Uh, so what's 88 million minus the 30 million? 58 million, got it, okay. Now, what are the expenses to operate this building? What are some of the expenses? You're the property manager, you have to put together these income statements around the property. What are your expense line items that you're looking at? Security, oh. maintenance, yeah. utilities. Security. Yeah, you got to clean the thing. Garbage, taxes, payroll, wages, maintenance, utilities. Also, you have a capital expenditure, a reserve account where you're putting in reserves for capital expenditures or capex at some point in time in the future. Okay. So, what you're going to end up here is net operating income. Okay. Net operating <coughs> So this is just a rudimentary income statement for uh, real estate. Now I checked, I wanted to check the valuation on this. So the, what we're gonna do is we take the 58 million, this is called the income. This is called the income capitalization approach. one of the valuation methods to value the real estate. And the income capitalization rate basically says that to get the value of the property, we take the net operating income divided by some discount rate, which is called the cap rate. And that's going to give you the value of the property. And the cap rate basically is the net operating income in the market divided by the value of the price. So I can go out and find comparable properties that have sold in the, in the marketplace, get the capitalization rate, and apply it to our property's debt operating income to get the value of our property. And since the, and we usually use, uh, in San Francisco, cap rates for these types of buildings, and this is a very unique building. There's no building like this anywhere. Um, 
maybe in Boston or New York or LA or you know Tokyo or Singapore or London or Hong Kong or Paris or Moscow. Um, this is an international quality building. Is it because of the structure or material? The size, the structural, um, the technology, the technology. architecture, um, all of that stuff comes in. It's location, the tenants, the developer, the architect, all of that comes in. And it's in a world class. Is it to upgrade for like technology purposes? Excuse me? Is it to upgrade for technology purposes? Well, the technology is, is used to manage the building. Wow. Technology is used to design the materials to construct the building. Wow. The technology is used to engineer the building, to do the architecture, to okay. construct the building. Okay. So these buildings, I think we take them for granted. They're basically pieces of technology. Um, I took, uh, I know that for these buildings and expenses normally run around 40% of the gross potential rental income. But since this building is so new and efficient, I took the operating expense percentage down to 30%. So I, uh, that was for me. And it was 30% of the gross potential rental income. So these buildings, buildings like this that are selling, this building hasn't sold, <coughs> okay? But if it did sell and you looked at cap rates for similar buildings on a global basis, Hong Kong, Singapore, Tokyo, you know, Seoul, you name it, they would be trading at a 5% cap rate, 5%. So if you take the 58 million and you divide it by 0.05, you get a value of 1.2 billion, which is pretty close to the 1.4 billion. Okay. So that kind of does a confirmation, a valuation confirmation. Okay. So that was basically your crash course in institutional commercial real estate. So but what they did do is they did give us not only the gross potential rental income multipliers, but they also gave us the I know that's what we have to use. So we're going to use the gross potential rental income of 100 million. And then there was similar buildings that were sold, maybe not in San Francisco, but maybe in global markets, because San Francisco is a global market now, of similar uh, mul multipliers, uh, gross potential rental income multipliers. Uh, what did they give us? 24? Four times 22. Yeah, 22 times and uh, 20 times. So if you know the if you know the sales price, and you take the gross potential rental income, you're going to get the gross potential rental income. So we went out and found a bunch of buildings that had sold. Found their prices, divided it by their gross potential rental income, and came up with the multipliers. And these are the multipliers. So what's the 100 million times 24? 240 million. 2.4 million. And what's 22 times 100 million? What's 100 million times 22? I, I know, I'm just racking your brain on the math. Thank you. And then what is 100 million times uh, 20? And we'll just pick the next point, which is 2.2. That's significantly higher than the 1.4, 1.2, and 1.4. Okay. So we'll talk about that in a minute. There's got to be a real call option embedded in there. Where the marketplace is anticipating higher rental income or higher land values in the future. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to value the property. We know what the cost of development is going to be. So we want to figure out the value so we can calculate the net present value and figure out if we're going to do this, this project. So 
what's the first year cash flow? Do you guys have any calculators? You're going to have to do the calculation. I'll give you some time to set up the problem. What's the holding period? Usually when we underwrite these things, we use a, uh, a pro forma cash flow statement uh, for 10 years. We usually go up 10 years. But I didn't want to do 10 years of this. I only wanted to do five. So I shortened the holding period. Very seven this up. And some of you are probably already calculating it. template. All right. So what's the first year cash flow? Eighty four million. Eighty four million. How do we get year two? Times one point here. What is it? One point one. Mm -hmm. okay, so what's um, eighty four million times one point one? Year three? 1.08. And what is 82.4 times 1.08? 99 99.7. Can I get confirmation on these? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And then how do we get year four? 1.02. Six and what is ninety nine point seven times one point zero six? One oh five point seven. Got it. Okay. And then how do we get to year five? Seven times one point zero four. One oh nine point nine. One oh nine point nine. Got it. And then how do we get year six? Times one point zero two. And what's one oh nine point one times one point zero two? Oh one oh nine point nine. And what's one point zero two times one point one oh nine point nine? Assume, should we assume that the cash flows are going to remain flat forever or grow at a constant rate? Grow at a constant rate. Yeah. Uh, in real estate, um, real estate's amazing. They basically built these money machines, which are called buildings, and they attach them to the land. And basically, these things just crank out money forever. Okay. And what's amazing is that the lease contracts, you as the tenant, you sign a lease with me, the landlord for a certain period of time. And embedded in these office leases, the lease contract basically states that the rent is gonna increase at the local inflation rate over the term of the contract, of the term of the lease contract. It's 12 months, right? No, most of the uh, leases in these buildings go from uh, five to 10 years. And the lease contracts have uh, basically CPI adjustments in them. So every year, whatever the CPI, the rent goes up by that amount. 
So basically, what has the average inflation rate been since, you know, post-World War II? So basically, the, uh, the your your rents, you know, the cash flows are going to grow at between th at least three and five percent forever. Okay. So what's the yes sir? Does WeWork put that stuff in their leases too? Um, I don't know how WeWork. They're, they're leasing the building. We, somebody else's leases. Yeah. Else so we, WeWork uh -huh. is leasing uh -huh. is the master uh, lessor. Yeah. Okay. So they're leasing it. From the landlord, uh -huh. okay. So they, so the landlord, uh -huh. in the WeWorks lease contract, they are putting in a CPI adjustment. Uh -huh. And then WeWork puts another CPI adjustment to their contract. Uh, I don't know how they actually do that. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how WeWork does it. If it, if they charge daily, uh -huh. or they charge if it's like a multi-part pricing okay. system where it's like I'm Joe Blow, I want to come in. I need to lease out X amount of space with certain types of amenities for X number of weeks. Okay. The people in, in the WeWork space are not long-term tenants. Okay. If they were a company that had a bunch of employees, maybe 15 to you know, 50 employees, they're not going into WeWork. They're going to go find some space and they're going to negotiate directly with the landlord that owns the building to get maybe a three year or five year lease contract. Okay. So the, we know that the cash flows are going to grow at a constant rate forever, so we're going to use the global growth model. So what's the terminal discount rate? No, uh, discount rate. Our expected return. 13. And why is it higher than the, than the going in? Risk, exactly. And what's the terminal growth rate? Assumption 2%. What's the answer? Is it 11? Okay. So, what's um, what's the uh, what's the 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 so people are waiting for the calculations. 1019.1. What is it? 1019. 1019.1. Got it. Okay. So 1019000000 something like that. Okay. And then what do we do with that? What do we do with the terminal value? Yeah, year five. We add it to the year, add to your cash flow. Fifth year system. So it's 1019.9 plus 1019 million. Take 1019 plus 1099. So what's the total cash flow that we're going to receive in the last year of the holding period? What is it? 1129. Okay, is that what everybody got? Yes. Okay, thank you. And then what's our discount rate? What's our expected return? 11%. 11%. Can you calculate the discount factors for me? So what's 1.11 squared? 1.21. What's 1.11 cubed? What's 1.11 to the fourth? And what's 1.11 to the fifth? Is that correct? Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Where do you want to start? We can start back here, we can start up there. We can go home. Year one. Yeah, year one. So what's 84 million divided by 1.11? What is it? 76.3. Okay, can I get confirmation? Yep. Okay. What's 92.4 divided by 1.21? What's 99.7 divided by 1.33? 74.96. Uh, what's 
105.7 divided by 1.46. What's uh, 109.9 divided by 1.6? You used that. Uh, what? You used uh, Damn, I was trying to get you. You caught me. Okay, what's 1129 divided by 1.61? I always get one or two people. So what's 1129 divided by 1.61? 701.24. And can you add these up and give me the present value? Basically a billion. Billion, two point two billion, one point two billion, one point four billion, seven hundred and sixty-four million. What's going on here? What's the cost of construction? How much is it gonna cost for us to <coughs> develop this thing? What is it? One point five and we're valuing using the Multiple approach uh, at 2.2 billion. Would we uh, we could sell it? We could build it for 1.5 and sell it for 2.2. Would you do that? Yeah. Heck yeah, you would. You make a billion dollar profit. A billion dollars. Yeah. Hold on. What do you think people in real estate make so much money? 2.2. What was the cost of construction? 1.5. What's our net present value? What's our net present value? 1.2. What is it? 600 million? Is that right? And is our net present value positive, zero, or negative? Positive. Positive. Do we accept or reject? Boston property build it, build the building. Yeah. Yep. They did it. Why? Because their present value was significantly positive, well above the cost of construction. So they did it. They took into consideration all of the risk of doing such a huge, massive project because the economics were so huge. They didn't do a very good job on the underwriting. We didn't do a very good job on the because the market's willing to pay 24, 22, and 20 times gross potential rental income. The market is valuing the building at 2.2 billion. So where did we make our mistakes in the underwriting? We're going to the board of directors. We're going to the investment committee. And the investment committee is going to look at your uh, discounted cash flow model and basically say you guys totally missed it. Because the market's <coughs> pricing the, the project at 2.2 billion, you came up with a billion. So where did you make your mistakes? Spent too much on construction? No, the construction costs are fixed. Oh. Uh, yeah, we could have, you know, we could have, you know, yeah, let's get to that in a minute. But let's, let's focus on the, the problem at hand. The problem at hand right now is not, is not the cost of construction. The cost of construction is the cost of construction. Where did you make your mistakes? Growth rates? Yeah. Yep. So did you over underestimate your growth rates? Under. Totally. You severely underestimated your pro forma cash flow growth rates. The market is obviously um, oh. anticipating significantly higher growth rates. Not only the pro forma growth rates, but also the what other growth rates? What other growth rates are used? Uh, yeah, like in the Gordon growth model, the going in constant growth rate was probably severely underestimated, right? Because if we increase the if we increase the five percent to maybe fifteen percent or twenty five percent, what would you what would be the valuation? Q 
Can I back into the evaluation? Can I solve the problem? Can I rearrange the mathematics to come up with the growth rate? Yeah. So rearrange it and come up with the growth rate that you need to get to the 2.2 billion. So that's how you would do it. So you know that you severely underestimated the growth rate. Solve for the growth rate that you would get to get to 2.2 billion. That's what you would do. Okay. Uh, what else? Where else did we make a mistake? Did we overestimate the income or underestimate it? We underestimated it. Especially what, what cash flow did we underestimate? How do we how do we calculate how do we start this thing? The net of income. Yeah, not in what year? What? Yeah, but how do we get to year one? Year zero. You get to zero year zero. So could we have severely underestimated the first year additional cash flow? Yeah. Where else could we have made on the stairs? The rent price per square foot? Yeah, we could have, maybe it's not 100 bucks a square foot, maybe it's 150 bucks a square foot. Okay, so we'd have to go back and adjust it, do a rental survey and adjust it up. Okay, what else? I can't move the square footage of the building. I can't make the building bigger, yeah. so it's not there. Uh, where else did we make the mistake? Yeah, the terminal growth rate, did we over or underestimate it? We underestimated it. Okay, where else did we could have made our mistakes? Where else could we have made our mistakes? What? I don't know if somebody said it's the gross potential rental income. Yeah, that's where the 100 bucks a square foot comes in. Where else could we have made our mistakes? What I'm teaching you here is fundamentals. Okay. You guys who are in sports, you sports people, <coughs> that you have to be really good at the fundamentals to be good. Yeah, it's all in the fundamentals. Okay. Technicals are nice. You can win games tactically, maybe operationally, but you, you can't win year over year over year without fundamentals. Okay. So where else are, did we make a mistake? Or could it? Yeah, we did. We talked about that and the going in and the term okay. and the initial cash flow. If we did it over 10 years, would it be more? Um, theoretically, it should make a difference. Uh, we already um, said that we probably underestimated the uh, first year, you know, this year's net operating income and the growth rates. See, what you're doing is you're just waiting for me to give you the answer as opposed to going to your notes and being systematic about the approach. That's why you take notes. Do we overestimate uh, expenses? Uh, we could have overestimated the expenses, but those are standard. Standard. Those are standard. So where else could we have made a mistake? It's a checklist, right? You just go down the list and you just check off the checklist. So where else did we make could could have made our mistakes? Are you gonna have to do any audits? Are you gonna be what? Uh that's a standard. might have overestimated the, uh, the multiples. We might have overestimated the multiples, but probably not. We're, cost we're, of development? Uh, we don't, we're not there yet. The cost of, we're going to assume that the cost of development is fixed. Usually cost of development is going up. So we um, usually you know, underestimate that, not overestimate. It's on your sheet. 
and it's in your notes. And we've already gone through it like four times. So where else did we make our mistakes? Uh, are you going to be doing any auditing? In any role, in any position that you're in, you <coughs> have to do audits. Yeah. Will, the, will the checklists be the same? Really? Most of the time. Yeah. Most of the time they're going to be the same. Right? Maybe they might change a little bit, but basically you have a checklist and you go through the checklist. So on your checklist, what are you missing? Where did you make your mistakes? Or could you have made your mistakes? assumptions here. And you haven't talked about all the assumptions. What assumptions do we have that we have not talked about yet? We're not using EBITDA, we're using that operating income. What is it? We're not going there yet. The development costs are usually fixed and increasing. Discount factors? Uh, yeah, and to get the discount factors, what do you have to what do you plug in? You do the expected rate of return. Okay, got it. Expected rate of return. Now we're, now we're cranking. All right. So if the valuation is really high using the multiple approach, is your discount rate too high or too low? We're coming up with a billion dollars, the market's saying 2.2. Too low. Too low. So is your discount factor, is your discount rate too high or too low? Too low. Too low. Really? So when the, since it's too low, the valuation goes up. What's the problem? It's too high. Maybe you're using too high of a discount rate. All right, so that was that. This is easy. Okay, but what happens if the um, construction costs? You totally underestimated your construction costs. Now what's your net present value? Negative what? 300. Negative 300. Your net present value is negative 300. Do you accept or reject? Did Boston Properties want to do this? Yep. So what did it do? Went to iteration two. Well, they can't reduce the, pr the price because the building wasn't for sale. It's a de development. So they got to go back and they got to review all their construction costs. Yep. I have a question. So let's say we did the first iteration and it came out to the next step. Did they stop there and not do anything else here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're done. Okay. But it's got to be significant. And they probably can be close. And what they'll probably do is they'll probably update all of the assumptions right. over the years of the construction to make sure that things don't change. Right. But let's say things did change. Right. And that labor cost and material cost spiked significantly and they basically re underwrote it and came up with the two point five billion dollar development cost. Now they're looking at a negative net present value of three hundred million, they're gonna reject it, but they really want to do it. So now they got to go to iteration two. Okay. And now what they're going to do is they're going to try to reduce the cost of, of development. So they're going to go back to the seller of the land, which was the city, and they're going to say, hey, can you give us a lower price on the land? They're going to go back to the city. What? After they already bought it? Now they might have just had an option on it. Oh, okay. Uh, and then they go back to the uh, city and they say, hey, can you 
maybe lower the exaction fees, the exaction fees that you're going to charge us for affordable housing and public infrastructure and you know utilities, you know, you know, lines, rail lines, because these buildings have major environmental impacts. Um, can you lower or give us some subsidies on the infrastructure? Sewage, garbage, you know, electrical coming in. Uh, go back to the unions and renegotiate the labor contracts. See if we can get those down, but that's not really easy to do. And then maybe renegotiate with your supply chain. Most of the materials came from uh, China um, because uh, there's really no manufacturing capabilities in the United States to, to basically build these massive buildings of scale, particularly in New York. This one's not as big as the buildings that are being built in New York and Singapore and Moscow and places like that. Question. Is that our way some wide builders charge like extra taxes like, <coughs> like Mel Rose? Like if you uh, that's in residential. Mel Rose is a is a re residential special assessment tax. Okay. Uh, the, the exaction fees are similar to that. That's similar. Okay. Yeah, that will tax the developer. Okay. okay. And then there's other things that the that the developer could go back and try to bring down the costs. Um, so what is the uh, what is the amount of reduction in the cost need to be to make this project pencil? So the developer has to go back and start renegotiating the cost. What's the amount in which the developer has to reduce the costs to make this development work? Less than 300 million. So they're going to shave off 300 million bucks off of the cost of the development to get the uh, net present value to be zero for them to be able to accept the project. But let's say they can't. I mean, 300 million is a pretty big, you know, chunk to try to reduce, and they still want to do the project. So they can go now to iteration three and do what? What's iteration three? We basically just went through iteration three, so it should be easier to go through it again. So what's iteration three? Yeah, you're going to go back and review the assumptions. So you're going to go look at your expected rate of returns. Are your expected rate of returns too high or too low? Too high. Or your, or your pro forma growth rates, too high or too low? Uh, too, low. too low. Got it. Uh, were your multiples too high or too low? Too high. It, it could have been too high. Right? The market actually might have you know, inflected, and actually pricing has come down, and you might get lucky, right? Because if the pricing comes down, then your net present value starts to shrink. Um, what about the initial cash flow? Was it too high or too low? Uh, too low. It was too low. Uh, what about your uh, terminal growth rates and your going in growth rates? Too low. Yeah, you underestimated your going in and your terminal growth rates. Anything else? Did I miss anything? You could have, you know, a lot of you were actually going to the right place, too, um, by saying, okay, maybe we could lower the concessions or lower the vacancy rate or lower the expenses. You probably would go back and do that. Or maybe we underestimated the rent. You, you probably would go back and do that okay, to see if maybe you could increase the cash flows, either the NOI or the gross potential rental income to puff up or bring up the valuations, the cash flows. Of evaluations. But let's say you still get a negative net present value, then the fourth iteration is what? You calculate the, the value of the real call. real call option. Got it. And what is the value of the real call option going to be? Going to be greater than or equal to what? Net present value. The negative net present value of how much? 300. <coughs> And if the value of the real call option is greater than the negative net present value, 300 million, then your net net present value is what? Positive. Positive, and you <coughs> accept. And if the value of the real call option is equal to 
the negative net present value, then your net net present value is what? Absent. Zero, and you Absent. accept it. And if the value of the roll call option is less than the negative net present value, then your net net present value is what? Negative. Negative, and you reject. Got it. What are the two methods and models used to calculate the real call option? Black Scholes and the binomial tree. And what are the three major factors that drive the value of real call options? Management, Management decisions, decisions valuation. valuation volatility, and time value. Got it. All right. So let's do the next one. How much time do we have? <coughs> let's see how fast we can do this one. Now that you guys are all warmed up. So the next one we're going to do is we are we are East Hill Security. Okay. We're one of the top real estate investment banking firms in the United States. We have an office here in San Francisco. Uh, Alexandria, Alexandria REIT, Alexandria, which is a REIT out of uh, Washington, D.C., basically hired us to underwrite Mission Bay. And basically say, hey, not only can you underwrite Mission Bay for us because we don't know if we want to do the development, we want to be the master developer of Mission Bay. Does everybody know Mission Bay? Mission Bay, anchored by UCSF. Medical, biopharma, genetic research, the top research <coughs> science institution in the world located in Mission Bay in the South of Market area of San Francisco. So we are East Hill Secured, we're the investment banking firm. Not only are we going to help them underwrite this project, but we're going to help them finance it. We're going to help them get you know, bond financing through the city. We're going to issue stock. We're going to issue bonds. We're going to do project financing. We're going to do debt. We're going to do equity. We're going to bring in institutional investor partners co-invest in syndications on this thing, because basically this thing, this has been in the works for 30 years. It was Willie Brown that negotiated with UCSF to bring UCSF to Mission Bay. Then Mission Bay was rezoned and remastered planned as a residential com community into a cutting edge technology cluster. Okay. And that's Mission Bay right there, and there's your little chase center Right there, there's your little Chase Center. And that site where Chase Center is right there, that's where Salesforce was going to go, basically 10, 15 years ago. So Benny off worked with the city, and the city basically almost gave him that site. Yeah. They, he basically took all of the concessions from the city to buy the site, and then he sold the site so that the Chase Center could come in. So he made billions of dollars on real estate speculation. He totally hosed the city. <laughs> took him to the cleaners on it, and then just flipped the problem. Yeah, it was pretty unbelievable. Uh, some people say that's really smart. It is really smart. It's just, so he was never actually planning on putting those? I don't think so. I think for like a nanosecond. I mean, I was brought in on the project to basically underwrite uh, the residual land value and do some valuation around this, but I couldn't get my hands around the site uh, because it wasn't an office site. It might have been like a biomedical or a lab office space to conform to the land use, but to put a mid-rise or high-rise office building within a biomedical tech cluster just didn't make sense. So he probably had, you know, he probably knew that he could gain control of the property and then flip it at some point. And actually having an entertainment center in a tech cluster is a non-conforming use. But, you know, the city wanted it here, and, uh, you know. The city can't put any clauses on, like, the sale to him? Like, he can't sell it, make money on it? If they just give it to him? No, they basically gave him all the rights. And he could basically do whatever he wanted with it. And he made, you know, he made millions. Oh, so we're, we're going to do Mission Bay. So let's go through this. <coughs> I have to do a little real estate with you guys because like, you never know where you're going to end up in your careers. Okay. So 
let's go through the math again. We should be able to go through this quicker, right? Because we already know how the underwrite one is. Okay. So do they give us the, uh, do they give us the, they give us the net operating income? 150. So we don't even need to calculate anything. Okay. And what's our expected return? 12%. So what's 150 million divided by? Can you calculate that for me? 150 million divided by 0.12. What is it? 1.2. Yeah, got it. And then we know that this is 150 million. Got it. We know that this is 12. What's our Constant growth rate, assumption, the Gordon growth. What is it? It's one percent. What is it? What is it? What's the NOA constant growth rate? Two percent. Two percent. So what's 0.12 minus 0.02? That's 10. It's easy to do the math. So it's 1.5 billion. We're done. Am I going too fast? And we should be able to go really fast now. Okay. Do they give us any multiples? Do they give us any multiples? No. No, they don't. Twelve percent expected return. Yeah, can I calculate a multiple from the expected return? One divided by 0.12. Yep, one divided by 0.12. And that gives us what? Question. It might be in difficult. 8.33. Uh, 8.33. Okay. What's 8.33 times what are we going to use? 150. What's 8.33 times uh, 150? Billion. Okay. So what was our initial year cash flow? Next year's cash flow, sorry. 150. Yeah, 150. And what's the growth rate to get to the second year? 1.08. 1.08. And what's 150 times 1.08? 162, and then how do we get year three cash flow? 1.05. 1.05. So what's 162 million times 1.05? 170. What is it? 170.1. Okay. And then how do we get year four? 2%. 1.02. What's 170.1 times 1.02? 1.02. And then how do we get year five? Uh, 4.02. And what's 173.5 times 1.02? <coughs> 173.5. Okay. 
Is everybody checking this? Are you guys double checking the numbers to make sure they're right? Now, Dool, I believe you, but you guys got to be really super careful. You're going to be in a meeting and somebody's going to be throwing out the wrong numbers and then it'll take like 20 minutes to get through the problem and you'll go, oh, you made a mistake and you're going to piss everybody. So you're going to make everybody really upset because you weren't checking the numbers. It's going to happen. Okay. And it's going to be it's going to be bad. So you need to make sure that you're doing the calculations to verify and validate that the numbers are correct. Are these numbers correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what do we need to do to get the terminal on? Uh, use the expected return, the terminal. Yeah, and what is it? 14%. Uh, Great. And what is actually the going in discount rate? What's the going in? What's the initial discount rate? 12. 12. And why is it higher? Risk. Yep. You got it. You guys are awesome. And then what's the terminal growth rate? 1%. 1. So it's what? Uh, 0.13? So what's uh, 178.7 divided by 0.13? 130. 1,374. Somebody check that for me? Yes. Yep, okay. And then what do we do with the terminal value? Add it to you, Todd. Add it to that, 176.97. So what's 1374.9 plus 176.97? Point nine. Seven. Seven. Point nine. Uh, 155. 1.8. 155. 1.8. Like that? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, so now let's do the discount. So we know that this is 1.12. 1. 1. What's 1.12 1. 1 squared? 1.25. And what's 1.12 1. 1. cubed? 1.4. 1. 1.12 and the fourth? 1.457. 57. What's 1.12 1. 1. to the fifth? 1.76. 1. 76. Got it. What's 150 divided by 1.12? 133.9. 133.9. Uh, what's 162 divided by 1.25? 129. Okay. Uh, what's 170.1 divided by 1.4? 121.5. 121.5. What's 173.5 divided by 1.57? And what's 176.97 divided by 1.76? 100.5. Do you use that terminal? Okay, what's 155.1.8 divided by 1.76? 81.7, thank you. Can you add those up for me? We got 1.4 billion, 1 1.25, 1.5, and 1.25. 1.25, 1.4, 1.5, 1.4, 1.4. You see how I kind of got came to the logic? So we have 1.25. 
1.2. So that's at a low mark. We got 1.5 as a high, and we got 1.4 as a mid. the cost of development? 1.25. What is it? 1.25. 1.25. And what's the net present value? 175 million. How much? 175 million. 175 million. Yeah. Yeah, it's 175 million? Yes. Is it positive or negative or zero? Positive. We accept or reject? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Isn't it 150 million? 150, yeah, that's where I got that. Somebody Sorry. Somebody give me a one second. Yeah. I did it on one. 150. Alright. Accept or reject? What if the uh, construction cost below 150? What would be the net present value? What's the net present value? It's negative uh, 0 0.100. What is it? Negative uh, 0 0.1. No, it would be the net present value. What is it? Negative 10 million. Got it. Uh, would you accept or reject? Reject. Was Mission Day developed? Uh, so they still wanted to do the project, right? We're almost done. Yeah. So stay focused. Uh, okay. So what is the, <coughs> you have a negative 10 million. What do you need to reduce the cost by to get a net present value of zero? 10 million. And then you're going to have to go back and renegotiate, right? So you can get lower land acquisition costs, lower fees, lower infrastructure, maybe some subsidies, renegotiate with the unions, material cost of construction, you got to go back to your suppliers. But we still get a negative at present value, so we go to iteration three. And then what do we do? We review the assumptions. What assumptions do we review? You guys can just, you know, yell it out. I don't mind. You won't be, it won't be a problem. You're going to go back and look at the discount rates. Were the discount rates too high or too low? Too high or too low? Too high. Too high. What about the growth rates? Were they too high or too low? If I'm giving a negative net present value, are my growth rates too high or too low? Too low. Too, too low. low. What about the multiples? Too high or too low? Were the multiples too high or too low? Too high. The too multiple high. was the multiple there too high or too low? Too low. Uh, what about in this case? The last case it wasn't. Uh, what about the initial cash flow? Was it too high or too low? Was it was what? Too low. Too low. Too low. What about the uh, terminal growth rate? Too high or too low? What about the growth rates? Too high or too low? The initial growth rate in Gordon growth, the terminal growth rate, the growth rates across the performance, were they too high or too low? Too high. Too high or too low? Too low. Too low. Too low. Okay. You still have a negative net present value. What are you going to do now? What do you do now? Iteration four. I'm just going through it over and over and over again to burn it into your brain so you never forget. Reject. Uh, what do you? What's iteration four? Come on, you guys. We just went through it like ten minutes. Option. You calculate the value of the roll call option. What's the value of the roll call option need to be? Over a hundred million. Over ten. Ten. Ten hundred forty billion minus hundred fifty billion is a hundred. Oh, that's correct. 
correct, so it's not 10 million. <laughs> you guys set me up? You guys totally set me up? Yeah, yeah, great. Isn't that wonderful? You got one over on the professor. But you got one over on yourself, because you, you got that far without even noticing it. Okay. And when you're in the meetings and that stuff happens, you're fired. Okay. Because we're talking millions of dollars here. Uh, you'll get fired by not saying anything, Jim. <laughs> okay, so the value of the roll call option is going to be $100 million. Right. And if the value of the roll call option is greater than $100 million, then your net net present value is what? And then you, if the value of the roll call option is equal to $100 million, then the net net present value is what? Zero. Zero, and you do what? And then if the value of the Royal Column Auction is less than $100 million, then your net net present value is what? What? It's negative. Negative, and you? We're dead. Got it. Uh, what are the two uh, methods to calculate the Royal Column Auction? Like Scholes. Like Scholes and one of the binomial tree. What are the three factors that make up uh, the majority of the value of the Royal Column Auction? Binders and the city films. Evaluation and utility. Okay, how much time do I have? Perfect. We'll be done. Isn't this fun? You just go over stuff over and over and over and over again. To the point where you, if you don't, if you haven't gotten it by now, we went over it that many times. Um, <laughs> man, I don't know what to say. I've been trying to drive you crazy <coughs> teaching you finance. I think it worked. I think I went crazy in the process. All right. So the investment decision making was the last problem, which was the first problem on the exam. Right, so we're just going to go back and we're going to do it all over again, okay? So that you burn the stuff in your brain. So the rules, present value is greater than the price or the cost, present value equal to the price or the cost, present value less than the price or the cost. Net present value positive, zero negative, the internal rate of return greater than the lack or the discount rate, Higher R equal to the WAC, higher R less than the WAC. Break even less than three years, break even equal to three years, break even greater than three years. <clears throat> if the, let's just go through it. Present value greater than the price you accept. accept. Present value equal to the price. Accept. Present value less than the price. Reject. Net present value positive. Accept. Zero. Accept. Negative. Reject. Reject. Higher R greater than WAC. Accept. Are uh, equal to WAC? Accept. Are uh, uh, less than WAC? Accept. Break even less than three years? Accept. Break even equal to three years? Accept. Break even greater than three years? We get it. Got it. Okay, that's iteration one. Iteration two, if you still get a negative, oh, and this, this, is, this is the other thing, too. If you know one of them, then you know the other three. So if you know if the present value is greater than the price, then you know the MPVs. Positive, the IRR is greater than the WAC, and the break even is less than three. If you know that the present value is equal to the price, then you know that the net present value is zero. Higher R is equal to WAC, and the break even is equal to three years. If you know that the present value is less than the price, then you know that the net present value is negative. Higher R is less than the WAC, and the break even is greater than three years. If you still get a negative net present value, you're going to ask for the price reduction or reduce the cost in the amount of the negative net present value. If you still um, it can't get the price or the cost reduction, and you still have a negative net present value, you got to go to iteration three to basically review all of the assumptions. You got to look at all the growth rates, perform a cash flow growth rates, the terminal going in growth rate, you got to look at the initial cash flow, you got to look at the discount rates, both the going in and the terminal discount rates, and you got to review the multiples. If you still get a negative net present value, you've got one more iteration which is iteration four, which is the calculation of the real call option using binomial tree of black shoals. <clears throat> and the value of the real call option is going to be greater than or equal to the negative net present value to get a net net present value. If the net net present value is positive, you accept it. If it's zero, you accept it. If it's negative, you reject it. Uh, black shoals binomial tree are the two methods to calculate the value of the real call option and the three factors that drive the value of the real call option are management decisions, valuation volatility, and time value.